Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We are very honored to have Professor Elliot Cohen from the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Study in Washington, DC, delivering this very first and very important lecture for us as the S. Rajaranam School of International Studies commemorate our 25th anniversary. Well, the important thing is that uh, I'm sure all of you know who is Elliot Cohen. Uh, and uh, he has written many books and he is our experts on strategic studies. Many of us in RSIS are very proud of our association with him. And we are very honored that he has agreed to do this first lecture of our 25th anniversary commemoration to kick off all these activities. Yeah, and um, I believe that we should uh, let Professor Cohen uh, make his uh, wonderful speech tonight. He is actually talking on Shakespeare for strategists. I don't know, is this the title of a new book that he is embarking on or not? But uh, I am very sure we would have an interesting and very, very thought-provoking uh, session with him. Um, we in RSIS in Singapore, we hope to uh, uh, have a series of activities to commemorate our events, uh, our, our uh, anniversary. And in terms of strategic studies, uh, we have always understood it to be a very wide, somewhat complicated subject. Yeah, Many disciplines are involved. Many, body, many people tell me that traditionally we uh, look at strategic studies uh, in association with political science, international studies, history, military history, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Tonight, we are going to get uh, literature uh, in the form of Shakespearean characterization from Professor Cohen. Yeah, this really make strategy study even more exciting. Um, I think I should let uh, the professor make his uh, presentation. But before that, I'd like to remind everyone, uh, please uh, uh, ask your questions, post your comments uh, on the YouTube uh, chat box, which you see before you. Uh, and I will now pass the floor to, or the screen to, uh, Professor Elek Cohen. Over to you, Professor. Great. Well, thank you, Ambassador Ong. That was a, a wonderful introduction. It's really quite uh, wonderful to be here with you. I uh, I just regret that it's virtually. Uh, I very much wish I were there in person. And of, of course, I want to congratulate RSIS on its uh, 25th anniversary. I, I feel particularly close to uh, RSIS for two reasons. First, I was really present at the creation. In fact, when uh, then ambassador, of course, later on president, S.R. Nathan uh, had the idea for creating uh, this institution, uh, he consulted uh, my then dean, Paul Wolfowitz, who said, well, you really should talk to Professor Cohen. And uh, we talked a lot. Uh, we established a, a warm friendship that led to me then being on the uh, RSIS board and uh, visiting with you many times. And uh, the, the second tie is um, even the father of a graduate of RSIS. So I, I feel uh, very close to the institution and I'm delighted to be here. Okay, so the uh, topic that I wanna speak about is Shakespeare for strategists. Now, you might ask uh, why would a military historian, national security expert, uh, now a dean, begin teaching Shakespeare at a school of advanced international studies. And why is he writing a book about it? Well, uh, one reason uh, might be just it's it's fun and being a uh, dean, I can get away with it. And there's probably a little bit more truth in that than is healthy for me to admit, but it's not the whole truth. Nor is it enough to simply quote Samuel Johnson who once said that Shakespeare is a mirror to the world, although he's certainly that. So what I'd like to do is uh, to begin explaining this, go back to the beginning about seven or eight years ago when my wife and I went to the Folger Theater for a production of Henry VIII. And that's a play that scholars now think uh, after some debate, whether it was actually written by Shakespeare was indeed a Shakespeare product. Let me just... 
And in that play, uh, there is a soliloquy uh, by Cardinal Wolsey. So this is the, he was the chancellor to Henry VIII. He'd been an extraordinarily powerful man uh, and suddenly he's deposed and he gives this wonderful speech. He's actually, part of it is to himself, part of it is to his uh, loyal um, aide, Thomas Cromwell. Farewell, a long farewell to all my greatness. This is the state of man. Today he puts forth the tender leaves of hopes. Tomorrow blossoms and bears his blushing honors thick upon him. The third day comes a frost, a killing frost. And when he thinks good easy man, full surely his greatness is ripening, nips his root, and then he falls as I do. I have ventured like little wanton boys that swim on bladders this many summers in a sea of glory, but far beyond my depth. My high blown pride at length broke under me and now has left me weary and old with service to the mercy of a rude stream that must forever hide me. And then he, he ends, oh Cromwell, Cromwell, had I but served my God with half the zeal I served my king, he would not in mine age have left me naked to mine enemies. Well, um, when I, uh, I, I saw and heard those words, I said to myself, I know that guy. And of course, it's a very common sort of Washington story. Uh, and I suspect you know people like that. There are a lot of powerful people in this world who swim in a sea of glory, often beyond their depth. Well, seeing uh, that performance and then sharing that speech with my students uh, led to a course, and that's leading to a book which I'll be writing on when I'm on sabbatical next year. The book is going to be called Rough Magic, Shakespeare on Gaining, Using, and Losing Power. Well, you might say, what, what you, what, why would you think that you have something to say about this? Well, I can say that it's one thing to read about Richard II or Goneril or Iago or to see them on the stage. I've had to work with them or at least observe them pretty closely. Uh, I've had a very fortunate career. I've served repeatedly at uh, high levels of the United States government. Uh, and as a dean, you get to see the workings of power as well. I think most literature professors don't get those opportunities and most politicians or deans don't have enough Shakespeare to make the connections. Okay, so what does Shakespeare have to teach strategists in particular or students of strategy? Well, there's some things that you get in a general way, the art of close reading, attention to language, to settings, to words, but there's much more. Uh, Shakespeare portrays political and military figures in the middle of war foreign wars, dynastic wars, civil wars, coups and insurrections. In other words, the raw material that we study. And what Shakespeare is about is not movements or ideologies. He takes a few swipes at the Puritans, but that's about it. Nor is he really about culture, which he transcends. After all, this is the most widely translated author in the world, and he is a universal author. After all, the great Japanese uh, film director, Akira Kurosawa, could turn Macbeth into Throne of Blood and Lear into Ron. No, Shakespeare is all about character and psychology. And if there's one thing that we have been learning over the last few years, it is that character and psychology matter enormously when it comes to power, including the use of military power. And that is what Shakespeare is all about. So how do we learn from Shakespeare? Well, clearly a large part of his power is the ability to fully realize political persons, a Cassius or a Julius Caesar or a Henry Bolingbroke or Macbeth, and they are as fully developed as any real people that we know. And indeed, we often feel that we know them better than some real people that we know. But there's a lot more than that. There are a lot of ways that Shakespeare offers us political insight in his careful use of language, in his design of scenes and speeches. And let me mention just one of Shakespeare's most powerful conceptions, one which is profoundly relevant to the study of strategy, namely that politics has very, very large elements of theater. For example, think of the play Henry V with the warrior king Henry uh, going around uh, talking to his demoralized troops just before the great battle of Agincourt. The, his army is uh, outnumbered. They know that the cause that they're fighting for is not particularly good. In movie depictions of uh, Henry V, it's usually raining. 
And he goes from campfire to campfire, and the chorus describes what he does and sums it up with a beautiful phrase, a touch of Harry in the night. He's going around, he's talking to the troops about nothing in particular, really, but just exercising influence. Well, that's actually what a lot of military leadership has always been about and still is, a touch of Harry in the night. Shakespeare takes that metaphor of politics as theater through the frequent device of a play within the play. That We see that most famously in Hamlet, where there's a troupe of visiting actors who Hamlet directs. But actually, I think the idea of a play within a play is there throughout many of his works. Somebody's orchestrating a scene. Henry V was a master at it, or at least the Shakespearean rendering of him. He's always creating scenes in which other peoples are actors, and he is some incredible uh, combination of the playwright, the acting coach, the director, and the heroic lead himself. But there are many, many examples of this. Cassius, for example, trying to win Brutus over to the plot against Caesar. Or Richard II trying in a weak and ineffectual way to dominate his kingdom through really overwrought histri histrionics, a really uh, bad uh, act, if you will. So too, for us, as well as Shakespeare, politics can be understood as theater. There's a stage, there's an audience, there's frequently a script, there are actors, there's a director. And if you think about it, it's really about as powerful a metaphor as one can have. And I think it can help us avoid some of the usual oversimplifications of political commentary. May not be our kind of play, but the actor may still be really good for the audience. And by the way, if you think armed conflict is not theater, think again. The destruction, for example, of the North Korean nuclear reactor in Syria in 2007, a, um, um, an event that I was very much involved with on the American side when I was counselor of the State Department, uh, that attack by the Israelis was a concrete action, but it was also very much a clever piece of theater done, if you will, completely in mime. That is to say, the Israelis decided very deliberately to say nothing. And that wasn't just for narrowly political reasons. They wanted this to be a part, a piece of military theater. Or the Russian mobilization on the Ukrainian border, theater. American and Chinese naval maneuvers in the South China Sea, theater. <clears throat> Shakespeare deals with the full arc of power. It's acquisition by inheritance or election or fraud or violence. That's really the story of Richard II and both parts one and two of Henry IV, also Macbeth. It's exercise in good, evil, or neutral ways. Richard III, Henry V, Henry VI, measure for measure. And it's loss by overthrow or voluntarily giving it up. For example, Lear or Tempest. By the way, the story of power very rarely ends happily in Shakespeare. And that's how I'm going to structure the book, The Arc of Power. Now, while Shakespeare deals with many kinds of politics, he particularly talks about courts. And if you think about it, those are a dominant kind of politics. Uh, I was just in uh, the, the White House complex uh, the other day. That's a court. A military headquarters is often a court. A political campaign is a court. When I uh, became counselor of the State Department and I got an office on the seventh floor, uh, a couple of doors down from the secretary, one of my senior State Department colleagues said, welcome to the Knights of the Round Table. So it was also a bit of a court. I'm afraid that the second floor of the uh, main building here at SICE, the NHTSA building, which is the executive suite, is probably something of a court as well. By the way, this is one of the reasons why the Henry VI play should be read a lot more frequently. Politicians, uh, I think, like to imagine that they're Henry V uh, playing the starring role. Uh, miniseries makers, uh, particularly if you think about those, uh, uh, both the British and the American version of House of Cards, think it's Richard III, sometimes Macbeth. Uh, journalists, I think, sometimes like to think of themselves as uh, Falstaff in Henry IV. But actually, Henry VI, which is a three-part play, is much more like normal court politics. Discontented advisors, 
clueless heirs, arrogant pretenders, sturdy but not necessarily deep generals, scheming politicians, entitled aristocrats, young people on the make, aging veterans hanging on, hopeless fantasists who believe in their own magic, and even a few sociopaths all struggling for power. Most of them don't do all that well. Now, I think Shakespeare's politics also invites us to consider the problem of motivation. And he does this sometimes by giving us a window into someone's soul, not always. In Othello, for example, Iago, who's the arch villain, refuses to explain himself and he remains something of a mystery. Uh, and I think none of us really believe at the end of the play that he will reveal himself. But more often he does give us a window into the soul and he does that through what I think is his most remarkable invention, the soliloquy. And the example that I'm gonna show you here is from, uh, it's actually from Henry VI, part three, uh, but it's often shown together with Richard III. Richard III is the great villain king of, uh, of Shakespeare. Uh, there you see a picture of Laurence Olivier, the great English actor playing Richard III. And the, the scene here is, this is the middle of the, the, this incredible civil war, the War of the Roses. And uh, Richard's brother, Edward, has just been crowned king. Uh, he is something of a lecher. And uh, Richard, who is um, hunchback, who's crippled in some ways, uh, is thinking about his desire to be king. And uh, he will, in the play Richard III, we see him get there with an enormous amount of violence. So he begins with envy. Uh, his uh, brother has just made an insincere remark about uh, treating the, uh, the widow of the previous king well, and he, he despises his brother. Uh, and then he's listening, here are all the people who stand between me and the crown. He then thinks about his own ambition. And um, I think, and remember, this is just Richard III speaking to us, as the actors would say, breaking the fourth wall, uh, speaking directly to the audience. And usually in soliloquies, characters don't lie to themselves and they don't lie to us. They reveal what they're really thinking. And at the moment, what we see is ambition. Why then I do but dream on sovereignty, like one that stands upon a promontory and spies a far off shred, shore where he would tread, wishing his foot were equal with his eye and chides the sea that sunders him from thence, saying he'll lay it dry to have his way. So do I wish the crown. Well, this is just a pretty normal statement of ambition. He realizes that, and in the current situation, there's um, uh, very little chance that he's going to be king. And so he says, well, maybe I can, you know, make my way in the world some other way or find other things to satisfy me. And what you have here is he is very, um, he's very conscious of the fact that he is a, uh, that he's crippled, uh, that he's unattractive and that he's profoundly unlovable. By the way, I think this is usually quite true of, uh, of tyrants. And you see this kind of deep, essentially sexual frustration. Well, what happens next? He realizes there's nothing for him in life but to pursue power, to command, to check, to overbear such as our better person than myself. Um, I think this is true actually of a lot of dictators that this is the only joy that they can really know. They can't know the other kinds of joy that the rest of us um, uh, know. And it's quite interesting that he says that it, this, I, I won't be satisfied until this misshaped trunk that bears this head be round impaled with a glorious crown. The word impaled as always in Shakespeare is carefully chosen. Um, that's usually a cruel thing. Uh, that's a painful thing. It's interesting that that's how he thinks about it. It's not a pleasure or a release or anything like that. So, uh, of course, it doesn't end there. He then shows his desperation. 
describing himself as one lost in a thorny wood that's tearing at the thorns and is torn by the thorns. Uh, and he's going to, he says he's going to torment himself to acquire power. And from that torment, I will free myself or hew my way out with a bloody ax. And then you see him get kind of crazier and crazier. Um, he compares himself to Machiavelli. He says, I'm better than Machiavelli. I can smile and murder while I smile. Um, and at the end, can I do this and cannot get a crown? Tut, we're farther off, I'll pluck it down. So what, what we've seen there, I think, is a, um, a masterpiece that allows us to empathize with somebody who is a monster. And I think that's really important. Um, and it's important for students of strategy. Empathy, not sympathy, the ability to imagine what it's like. I mean, what, what Shakespeare has just done is he has walked us through the psychology of somebody who, who we at one level find loathsome and another way I think find absolutely fascinating. He begins with a statement of ambition, which we can understand, with a statement of frustration, which we can understand, with that bitter awareness that he's an unlovable human being. And those things eventually become something that are monstrous. And like many power mad people, and I have known a few, he doesn't understand that he will never be satisfied and never at peace. And this becomes something desperate and murderous. Well, we could spend an hour just discussing that soliloquy, um, but I wanna stress that point of empathy. Uh, which I would argue after courage is the supreme strategic virtue and is indeed essential for strategists. There's a wonderful book um, called The Duel by John Lukash, which is about Hitler, Hitler versus Churchill in 1940. And one of the things that Lukash says in that book is that the great advantage that Churchill had over Hitler is that Hitler could Churchill could imagine what it was like to be Hitler. Hitler could never imagine what it was like to be Churchill. That's a profound insight. And I think it's uh, one that's particularly relevant for people in the business of strategic thinking. Well, uh, politicians have always loved, <coughs> have always loved Shakespeare. And I, what I'd like to do is just give you a, uh, a couple of examples of those. <coughs> Uh, Shakespeare, uh, Lincoln knew a great deal of Shakespeare, uh, when early in his career, when he was traveling around, um, in Illinois, he, uh, would have copies of Shakespeare's plays, which that's how he, he would spend his evenings. Uh, this is a quote that he he, he was talking to some of his aides about Shakespeare, uh, and how marvelous Shakespeare was. This was on his way back from a visit to the front. Um, and it's, uh, it is a very famous Lincoln anecdote. He, uh, it's a quote actually from Macbeth after the murder of Duncan, that acknowledging that Duncan has been killed, has been assassinated, that was actually done by Macbeth. Uh, after life's fitful fever, he sleeps well, treason has done his worst, nor steel nor poison, Malice, domestic, foreign levy, nothing can touch him further. And of course, there's that those first lines, better be with the dead whom we to gain our peace have sent to peace than on the torture of the mind to lie in restless ecstasy. This passage clearly spoke to Lincoln. Five days later, uh, treason did its worst. And uh, Lincoln himself was assassinated at um, Ford Theater. Um, you know, the part of this that I think um, that somehow speaks to me of those first couple of lines because Lincoln felt very heavily the, the price that was being paid uh, in human life by the Civil War. Now, it would be a mistake to think that it's just the good guys uh, who uh, liked Shakespeare. The Nazis did too. Uh, one of the great plays, which is not um, uh, performed enough, is Coriolanus. So the story of Coriolanus is about a great Roman general 
who uh, wins all these victories for Rome, but he's eventually exiled uh, by the people. Uh, he is proud, he despises them, um, and he becomes a traitor and he turns on Rome and only at the very end does he, uh, he decide not to actually really destroy Rome. What's fascinating here is the Nazis adopted this play. And uh, there were several productions of it. <clears throat> Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda minister, took a particular interest in this. They saw this as an exposition of the weakness of democracy. Um, what does that tell us? I think it tells us that <clears throat> there's, there are worlds within Shakespeare. But I would also argue those who've been most steeped in Shakespeare are not that way. And the example that I'll give you, of course, is Winston Churchill. Churchill um, twice almost won the Shakespeare Prize in his, at, at Harrow, uh, the uh, school that he attended to. But it's really striking if you read through his communications as I have, how often he is quoting or invoking Shakespeare. Uh, for example, this is actually at the, the, at the height of the crisis of the Dardanelles in 1915. This is actually how he begins a letter to the first sea lord, Admiral Jackie Fisher. It, it, it just says, he says, uh, uh, there's the salutation, then he just goes right into this. And basically he's using Shakespeare to make the point that uh, now's the time to go all in. And there are many, many other examples of how he uses Shakespeare, which he knew really very, very well. But I think the most powerful thing is uh, this. So this is um, the original typescript of what perhaps Shakespeare's most, I mean, Churchill's most famous speech, the, uh, the finest hour speech given in 1940. Um, this is after Dunkirk. So this is uh, June, 1940, um, that he's saying the, the big battle's about to come. And uh, if we fail, then the whole world including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age, made more sinister and perhaps more protracted, that was the word he actually used rather than prolonged, by the lights of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duty and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth lasts for a thousand years, men will still say this was their finest hour. Now, what I'd like you to notice is the indentations. That's how Churchill had this written. And what one realizes as one looks closely at particularly um, Churchill's most famous speeches, they are Shakespearean blank verse. They may not necessarily be in iambic pentameter, which was the meter that Shakespeare used. Uh, Shakespeare didn't always use it. But it is elevated speech of the kind that, say, Henry V gives at Agincourt. And, um, and it is done in a, um, I think what you can only call a Shakespearean manner. So, you know, what does that, uh, what does that add up to? I think one of the, one of the things to, uh, to remember is the power of the English language, the, the power really of any language uh, when properly used to motivate people for war. You know, Sh Churchill later on after the war said that uh, it was the, uh, uh, the British people who had the lion's heart. It's just that he was fortunate to be called upon to give the lion's roar. Well, I don't think that's entirely true. I think those speeches made a huge difference and speech can make a big difference in mobilizing uh, countries for uh, for conflict. And this is a great example of it. Well, at the end of the day, uh, Shakespeare poses us, I think, some very difficult questions. One of them has to do whether, with the question whether the accomplishments of power, including military power, are lasting. Now, even at the end of Henry V, and Henry V is his hero king, <clears throat> the chorus steps up and says, you know, We've tried to show you what an extraordinary leader Henry V was, what a 
brilliant commander. And then they say, all these conquests fell apart under his son, Henry VI. Or think, for example, of his Roman plays, Julius Caesar, Antony and Cleopatra, Coriolanus, certainly Titus Andronicus, none of which indicate that Rome is a happy place. More profoundly, I think, um, one of the things that Shakespeare, that, that Shakespeare does is to explore very deeply what power does to those who wield it. And in my favorite play, Tempest, um, he explores that issue. At the very end of Tempest, um, Prospero, the great wizard, who had once been the Duke of Milan and has been overthrown by his brother, um, has ruled this island by magic. And uh, he actually has different subjects. He's got his daughter, that's one kind of relationship. He has <clears throat> Ariel, who's this sort of a spirit. Uh, there's Caliban, who's this rather brutish, uh, malevolent character. Uh, he conjures up a storm that brings together all the people who had done him wrong. Uh, and it all comes together in a pretty happy ending on the whole. But what's fascinating to me about uh, The Tempest are these lines in the final act. But this ref magic I hear abjure, I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and then deeper did ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book. Well, one has to ask oneself, why does he decide he has to give up on magic? And the, it turns out that the king who helped depose him is there. He says, you can be Duke of Milan back. I think Shakespeare recognizes the corrosive effects of power, um, in, including the kind of power that is exercised in the fields that we care about, uh, he understood that very well. And Prospero comes to understand that as well. I think Prospero understands that to be a full human being, uh, he has to give up, he has to give power up. And uh, as somebody who lives in a town filled with people who are obsessed with power, I can just say that I think that's a lesson that is very hard for people to learn. So in an age when I think all too many people are too certain that they know, and when too few really know how to read carefully, when our knowledge of character is limited frequently by the superficiality of our learning, I can think of really very few better preparations for a subtle understanding of the way in which power <clears throat> and indeed strategy operate than by reading the greatest political psychologist of all time. And yes, that would be none other than William Shakespeare. So thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador Ong, back over to you. And I'm happy to discuss anything that people want to talk about. Thank you very much, Professor Cohen. Uh, I must confess it's the first time I have seen so many quotes from Shakespearean play in a strategic study lecture. Yeah, but it's good. I must also confess that I used to hate Shakespeare in school, uh, but you have reminded me of all his uh, significant play that we were required to read in our school days. Yeah. So, um, well, there are some questions coming in. And <laughs> the first one that I thought Maybe I should uh, uh, tease you out a little bit. Some people are saying that, you know, as we were growing up, we were taught not to rely on films and movies uh, to depict the truth. Yeah, because they are always perhaps over simplification and uh, maybe even uh, what we call Hollywood, the depiction of the reality. So by looking at all these Shakespeare's uh, writing and uh, uh, plays, are we sort of looking at his depiction of his sense of the reality or actually he is trying to give us a mirror on the reality that he is uh, struggling with? So well, thank you. That's just a good way to start off. Our, yeah. Um, well, first I'll say you, I, you're not alone. I think most of us, my, to some extent, myself included, 
when you're exposed to Shakespeare at age 15 or 16, frankly, I think it's wasted on us. <laughs> um, and, you know, I've I, actually this semester I taught the course. I had one group of very, very bright Hopkins, Johns Hopkins freshmen, so first year students, and another um, our size students who ranged in age probably from their mid 20s up to their early 40s. And, and I'll have to say that the, the size students, I mean, the, 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 the first year students in Hopkins are brilliant. Um, and you could do a lot with them, but they didn't have the life experience to appreciate what Shakespeare was saying to them and what Shakespeare had to teach them. And uh, I do think that there's a lot in Shakespeare that we only get once we've been in the world. And I'll tell you from myself, um, I learn more and more each time I go back, which is one of the reasons why I'm very excited about this book. <clears throat> now, um, I think it's very important to bear in mind the distinction between historical truth <clears throat> and artistic truth. Is Shakespeare's depiction of Richard III correct? Well, there's actually a whole society that's out there uh, that <clears throat> just wants to say Shakespeare was wrong in painting Richard III as such a villain. And they're probably right. Uh, he was probably no worse than anybody else. But you know, that it's not really relevant. Um, there, there are insights, I believe, that we can get into human nature from things that are entirely fictional. It, I mean, it's one of the reasons why we read Tolstoy or, you know, authors like that. There are insights into human character, uh, insights into human motivation. And, you know, I'll, I'll go back to your, your very fine introduction <clears throat> when you were talking about uh, strategic studies being multidisciplinary. <clears throat> One of the most disconcerting things I would do, uh, I think there's some of my former students out here in the audience, uh, but one of the most disconcerting things I would do in my introductory strategy course is I would have a poem that I'd uh, read to the students at, uh, in the middle of each two and a half hour class. And I thought some of them, some of them clearly thought that I was just crazy. Uh, but after a while, I believe people began to realize, okay, there are, there are things that I can learn from literature or flashes of insight that I can get, which I won't quite get from, you know, more conventional kinds of historical or, or biographical accounts. And I do think that's the way to approach it. Now, the one thing I, I would say is it is a mistake to do as some people do and say, uh, this particular political character, usually somebody they don't like is Macbeth, or Richard III, or Iago. Uh, you know, for example, nobody can be really quite as conniving and brilliant and devious and horrible as Iago. I mean, he's just, he, he's just bad. Um, but I think we, all of us, you know, when you, you see that and read it, you realize, well, uh, I have seen Iago-like behaviors by some of the people I know, and I ask the same kinds of question about motivation that Shakespeare does. So it's a, it's a kind of indirect form of education. I don't take the plays as history. They're not Shakespeare, by the way, I'll just say one last thing. He felt very comfortable um, turning chronology upside down. So for example, the Henry the fourth plays, there's this tension between Prince Hal and Harry Hotspur. <laughs> They're the same age, and Prince Hal's father, Henry IV, really wishes that Hotspur were his son and not Hal. Well, in truth, Hotspur was his father's age. It wouldn't have made good theater, so Shakespeare just kind of ignored it, and and rightly rightly so. Uh, so don't take it as history, but I think do take it as as insight. <laughs> okay, another question along the same line is that. Uh... Who you think in contemporary times uh, is capable of giving one of those compelling uh, soliloquy? As you so, so in my class, what I do, one of the assignments I do, um, I, I give the students is say, write a soliloquy for a contemporary political figure. Oh, oh. And, and I get, I've gotten some wonderful, and when I say contemporary, I mean the last hundred years or so. 
I've gotten some wonderful, um, some wonderful examples uh, from, there was, I had one who it was the ghost of John F. Kennedy at his own funeral. Uh, another one we had this year was uh, a woman named Neera Tandon, who was, the, the Biden administration wanted to nominate her to be head of the Office of Management and Budget. And she, she went down because she'd been tweeting all kinds of stupid things about Republican senators. And the student just did a brilliant <laughs> uh, oh. soliloquy. The thing is, not everybody is capable of soliloquizing because uh, some people are not self-aware enough. I mean, Richard III is self-aware. Coriolanus, by the way, never gives a soliloquy. He's, and that's because he's a boy-like figure. Um, and like most boys, doesn't really have a lot of insight. The one political figure I'm, I'll mention who did do something like a soliloquy <clears throat> was Richard Nixon. When Richard Nixon left office, he gave a speech to his staff just basically before he get on, got on the helicopter to leave DC. And he talked about how corrosive hatred, political hatred was. And he, I mean, he was in a terrible emotional state, but it, it was a kind of soliloquy. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just wanted to add something. Uh, the wonders of uh, Shakespeare and all this literature that we study uh, and which you have now used uh, to look at the uh, strategic studies, they are all written in the English language. Yep. I wonder how, uh, for example, in today's context, can we find something in the Chinese language and translate it into something that reflect what Shakespeare say about power and ambition and all these other things? So, so one of one of my um, sabbatical projects is to uh, I want to read the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Yeah, uh, I mean that's obviously a classic text. I'm embarrassed that I've never read it. The, the thing that I, I, we did one class just on um, Kurosawa's versions of Shakespeare. And they're both Shakespeare and not Shakespeare. And part of the difference ha does have to do with uh, language, but part of it has to do with cultural context. And there, there's actually a vast literature on how Shakespeare comes across in different languages. Uh, you know, I mentioned uh, the Nazis. There, there was a magnificent German translation of Shakespeare in the middle of the 19th century, to the point that Germans referred to uh, Shakespeare as unsere Shakespeare, our Shakespeare, because they thought the translation was better than the original. <laughs> um, so I, I think, uh, I think it is a fascinating topic, and there is there is actually a literature on it. I'm I'm sure that he's been translated into Chinese. Um, but in terms of, you know, is there something comparable? I really, I don't know. Yeah. Another one uh, question is that, uh, do you think there are any uh, other writers uh, that you know, you mentioned uh, uh, Toy Story just now, uh, that can come close to reflecting what uh, Shakespeare has done in terms of his uh, yeah. plays I about politics and I, I don't really think so. You know, um, it is extraordinary that Shakespeare, you know, is a, this is an author who's more than four centuries past us, um, whose English is difficult even for in, native English spe speakers. <laughs> um, you know, if it's, if it's well acted, that doesn't matter as much as people think. But it's one of the reasons why 15 and 16 year olds go crazy because it doesn't sound like the English that they're used to hearing at home. <laughs> but but um, that is the most universally translated that is, you know, put on still put on stages all over the world. And I just don't know another author who's like that. The other thing is that that's so profound about Shakespeare is the extraordinary range of characters. Mm. He, there's a certain kind of professor, as you undoubtedly know, who writes the same book over and over again. 
uh, well, there's certain kinds of novelists and playwrights who write the same novel or the, do the same play over and over again. You know, they just tweak it a little bit. It's, um, it's not uncommon. Shakespeare doesn't do that. You know, his, uh, his weak kings, if you take, say, Richard II and Henry VI, who are both very weak kings, they're weak in very different ways. Uh, they both come to bad ends. You know, they're, they're killed by bad people, uh, but they're, they're very, very different. And so I, I do think there's something unique truly about Shakespeare. Okay, Professor, maybe I switch gear a little bit. So, you know, you were talking about this new book. Uh, how do you relate all that we have been talking about and listening to for the last uh, 45 minutes to what would be the most pressing strategic issues that we are confronted with today? So um, I think, I mean, I'll just speak from an American perspective. Yeah. Uh, you know, the most pressing international issue and strategic issue that the United States faces is um, the relationship with China mm -hmm. and a relationship which is uh, driven by rivalry mm -hmm. and increasingly by tension and hostility. And I think what um, what Shakespeare would point us to is the centrality of character. So I don't think it's possible to spend too much time studying Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. uh, and indeed, I think one could say, you know, one of the mistakes that people made in, in assessing China was failing to take into account um, what an extraordinary character he is. I think we got used to a China which had a kind of a collective leadership and, uh, you know, had kind of finally settled into some sort of regular transition and succession process. And now we've got something very, very different. Yeah. And um, I, I would say that for, for me, the study of the, of the central characters, one could say something about Russia, similar about Russia and Putin. You could say something similar about Turkey and uh, Erdogan. Um, you know, in democratic systems, it may be a little bit less, <clears throat> a little bit less important. But even there, I think that the focus on the the characters of particular leaders at this particular moment in time um, never has never been more important. But ultimately, I suppose it's not just the personality or the leader, the structure of the uh, place that they are in. They do play a part, isn't it? Uh, they, the culture. Yeah, they, they do. You know, there are certain. Um, I mean, there are certain kinds of actors who can only play certain kinds of roles, and in certain kinds of plays. And so, you probably the actor who can do a really good Falstaff uh, is probably not the actor who could do a really good Richard the <laughs> Third. Uh, and so, you know, Angela Merkel is one kind of political figure in Germany. Um, if you put her in the United States, she'd be a dismal, uh, she would be a dismal failure. But I, I do think that, um, you know, it's the nature, particularly of political science, which is the dominant discipline uh, in strategic studies, although it taps history and economics and other things, uh, to think about structural explanations of why things are the way they are. And I, I was trained as a political scientist. And even history today, as the profession has evolved, is um, particularly oriented towards structure. Whereas I think what Shakespeare points us to is individual psychology. Um, psychology, I think, by the way, has been a field that has been absent to some extent from strategic studies. Um, psychology and, and also contingency, that things you know, in Shakespeare, people usually have choices. Uh, you know, Macbeth has a choice. He can decide, is he going to kill his king and become king himself? Or is he not going to do it? And he, he wrestles with it. And that's another thing that I think we sometimes lose in the world of strategic studies. We assume that they're just simply these large impersonal forces that are moving around. When, in fact, there are contingent decisions made by particular human beings in particular times and ways. 
So Shakespeare is more important to a general or to a political leader? Uh, yeah, I, saw that. I, I see that that's, that's from my friend Pascal Venison. I have to say, by the way, I, uh, I'm, I'm getting a great kick out of seeing uh, names like Pascal Venison and Anit Mukherjee and Bernard Liu. There, these are all old, old and valued friends. Um, I would say uh, both Pascal, but um, I would say particularly political. Well, I'm not, I'm not even sure about that. I, I, you know, my first answer would have been political people because the plays are very, very political. Uh, and there are very few figures who are simply generals. Although the, the reason why they might be very good for generals is to help them understand <clears throat> the politicians that they have to deal with. You know, for me, the most, if you're interested in civil military relations, the most interesting play is Coriolanus. Because Coriolanus is the archetype of the, the great, soldier type um, who has in a exaggerated form some of the weaknesses that generals sometimes have. He is impatient with the demands of politics. He, if he wants to be in the play, he can become consul, which is what he wants to do because he, he wants, uh, he's ambitious, uh, but he has to, there's, a, there's an incredible moment where he has to show the people that there's a kind of a custom that you you have to show the population your wounds. They want him to take off his toga and show his wounds. Now he's gotten cut up pretty badly in Rome's wars, and um, he hates the thought of doing that. He thinks that's despicable. So he knows what his record is. They know what his record is. To expose himself in that way to the to the demos, to the people, is just something he can't do. And it shows his limits as operating in a political environment. Some of the other patricians in the play understand that you got to do what you got to do to survive in in politics. So I guess there's a case for the generals also. Yeah, well, you know. In these times in Southeast Asia, we have to deal with the situation of the generals in Myanmar. And people lamented about what, uh, you know, if Aung San Suu Kyi acted differently, displaying yeah. political leadership, uh, what would be the situation be? Yeah. Well, these are the things that we debate among ourselves uh, post facto. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think it's really valuable to remind ourselves of contingency. I, you know, I see that um, you know, one of the issues that uh, people are raising is, well, doesn't Shakespeare believe in people being trapped by fate? I don't really think so. I, th I think actually um, Sh Shakespeare does believe very much in the freedom of choice um, and in human beings making their own destiny by what they do. You know, one of the things that's interesting about Shakespeare is there are a lot of ghosts and witches and things like that, which are great fun. Hmm. At the end of the day, they don't actually have a lot of power over what human beings do. And, and one way to think about that is that uh, those are those forces that are outside of our control and they can tempt you or mislead you, but but at the end of the day, it's your, it's your decisions that put you where, where you are. And, um, you know, I think, he, I think he's right. And your choices are not foreordained. I think that's another kind of powerful lesson we get from Shakespeare. Yeah. One of my colleagues here also asked about, you know, the um, Shakespearean play the characterization of the female uh, yeah. is usually more intelligent uh, than the male, character, male characters. Yeah. So I was yeah, asking I, if Aung San Suu Kyi had been uh, a bit more astute, we might have uh, uh, one of those uh, intelligent female characters from one of the six period pay. That, that is one of the extraordinary things. Uh, of course, in this way, again, I think Shakespeare does indeed mirror life. Um, that you know, the women are are such interesting and uh, powerful characters. I had one student who had actually been a Shakespearean actor, and um, 
he uh, was I was talking to him once and he I said, what was the most interesting role that you had to play? I said, well, they did uh, the, the, in Shakespeare's time, women did not play the female roles. They were teenage boys. Mm -hmm. uh, who would you know, basically before their voices cracked would um, would play the female roles. He said, well, they, they he was part of a troupe and they decided to put on a Shakespearean play the way it would have been put on back then. In other words, an entirely male cast. And he played Desdemona in Othello. Uh, Desdemona is Othello's wife who he kind of cra crazily begins to suspect and eventually murders. And he said that, I said, what did you learn from that? He said, what I learned from that is actually Desdemona is in charge of every scene until the one in which she gets killed, that she is actually a very powerful figure. Um, he said, I had never really delved into the character before, but that's what I learned. And that's not uncommon. There are a lot of Shakespeare's plays where the women are, in fact, the, um, the more astute and the more powerful figures. Thank you, Professor. I think we are coming to the close of our this uh, very interesting program. Uh, I thought maybe I should try a last uh, question for you, which is that as we celebrate our 25th anniversary in RSIS, and as our focus has traditionally been on strategic studies, going forward, uh, is there something that we can do better in terms of the study of strategic studies? Mm. Uh, uh, I ask this because um, these days there's so much of digitalization, so much of social media, less of thinking and less of, uh, you know, deliberate pondering of uh, implications of our actions and all that. And all these have an under, uh, underlying uh, uh, consequence for our study of strategic uh, study of strategies and uh, the future of strategy studies uh, uh, for our policy makers. So I just wanted to uh, have a thought on this. Is there something? Uh, I, I, I think the, you know, first you've put your finger on what I, I think is one of the great challenges of professional education, which is the business I'm in as well. Uh, and that is um, really trying to cultivate linear thought. You know, the, we, the the web and uh, the internet make us tend to jump from link to link to link to link rather than think things through. And there are ways that you can deal with that in the classroom. Um, and again, it's one of the reasons why I like Shakespeare. Shakespeare teaches you to look very closely at things or you, you can use Shakespeare to teach people to look closely at things. I would say the second thing that I would, um, uh, that I would say is you know, the world is just in extraordinary flux right now. And I, I certainly don't feel that I've got a good grip on what's going on. And I think to the extent that um, one can open up a curriculum to, to try to address a very wide range of topics and, and help students begin to integrate them, uh, the better off. And I would say that it's true of many things particularly technology, you know, I'm increasingly convinced that machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, you know, unmanned system, all that stuff is transforming the use of, of power in quite, quite formidable ways. And finally, I would say that the nature of conflict, it does seem to me to be changing. When I look at, you know, the conflict, say in Libya or Armenia and, um, Azerbaijan, or indeed in the South China Sea, or say between Israel and Iran, these don't look like the kinds of wars that we've seen in the past. Mm -hmm. And I really do believe that we need to, um, we need, really need to rethink those in terms of the paradigms that particularly those of us who are older grew up with because they may no longer be um, applicable and the very, I guess two last things I'll say. One is again Shakespeare and any form of art appeals to the imagination. And to the extent we can free our imagination and it can be through, for example, science fiction. Um, anything that frees our imagination is gonna be a good thing for the study of uh, strategy. And the last thing I'll just say is uh, 
just how much I've enjoyed being with you and uh, with with all my friends virtually. And I just how much I look forward to being there in person sometime. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor. We look forward to uh, seeing you in person in Singapore, or some of us may be able to make it to your beloved school to look up uh, for you personally. Uh, Either way. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Well, back, back to you, uh, 